What's up everybody? Welcome to Found Flicks. On this ending explained, we've got another long requested one for you, The Collector, where a down and out criminal's heist goes horribly wrong when a deranged and meticulous killer wreaks havoc upon a family's home. And yes, I will be looking at the second film, The Collection, in a video coming soon to make sure to cover everything we can on the short series. Okay, these movies have an important backstory because as the cover proudly states, they all hail from the twisted minds of Saw 4, 5, and 6, and actually later 7 as well. The parallels between the collector and Jigsaw killers are impossible to deny, but it can't be considered a ripoff, as the script was actually originally pitched as a prequel Saw movie showing us Jigsaw's earlier days. The filmmakers were turned down and changed the script to become a new killer character, the collector with his weird bondage mask and eerie glowing eyes. But much of the Jigsaw DNA is still in the character, especially his penchant for violent and torturous traps. But a key difference between the two is how active involved the collector is in his human playthings. I appreciate a killer who's willing to do the legwork, and he does get actively involved in the scenario, capturing and torturing his victims himself, whereas Jigsaw is generally very hands-off, setting up his series of traps and watching everything go down on a video monitor and letting a puppet on a tricycle do the talking for him. So while certainly similar in many aspects, they are actually both quite different villains, and to me that's the reason that these movies work at all. There's something compelling about just how how vicious and unrelenting the collector is, as well as keeping much of his intentions and motivations a mystery. Meanwhile, the movie that he's in is pretty rote torture porn fare. Sure, the kills are chock full of that wonderful lingering torture, but that's pretty much the extent of what the movie succeeds at in my opinion. I don't dislike it per se, but I like the collector character so much that I wish he was introduced in a more compelling story rather than what we get here. Regardless, there is much to look at as far as digging into the collector character, and there are many clues throughout the film that fill us in on who he is and what he wants. So let's check out The Collector, breaking down the movie, everything we learn about the killer, and explaining the cliffhanger ending that leads us right into the story of the next film. In our opening sequence, a couple comes home from a night out, seeing their house is under construction. And damn, who let in all the fog? Foggy as heck up in this piece. The wife heads upstairs as her husband Larry checks the mail, trying a light to see better, but finding the power has been cut. Soon hearing his wife screaming out for him, he rushes to their bedroom, seeing a a large red trunk on the floor, including a card on top that reads, For the Collection. A loud bang rings out from inside the box, and he decides to open it despite his wife urging him not to, shocked by what he sees and immediately getting grabbed by someone from behind. Just as the couple who are completely confused and surprised by what just happened, the opening doesn't give us much to go on, setting up only that there is a deranged killer on the loose, the couple being his latest victims. This brings us to the opening credits, not something I normally would talk about, but these are pretty special. A weird collection of random grungy images set to an extremely hot tune that's like Nine Inch Nails meets Jungle Dubstep. Yeah. That's some hot funky shit. Sometime later, the collector has selected his next target, the Davis family, whose house is also under construction, where he poses as an exterminator to case the place beforehand, seeing him walking in undetected. But they have no reason to suspect him, easily blending in with all the other crew at the house. The crew also includes our not exactly heroic protagonist, Arkin O'Brien, who has a shady criminal past and looks like he always needs a nap, who, as we come to learn, hasn't given up entirely on this line of work, despite trying to hold down a normal job in construction. The father might Michael is a jewelry dealer, and Arkin has his eyes on a ruby he knows is kept somewhere in the house. And that's the real reason why he's here. Though it does seem like a nice enough guy, bonding with the youngest daughter Hannah and having a lovely little tea party. Damn, foggy as hell in here too. Cool it with the fog machine already. Jeez, guys. The Davis family is heading out for vacation for a few weeks, Michael giving Arkin a little extra pay for his daughter, meeting her at a bowling alley with a special Build-A-Bear surprise. But his wife Lisa isn't happy with his gesture, as they clearly are having money troubles that have gotten to a quite severe point. Lisa is in debt to some greasy loan sharks and her payment is due today. Though Arkin gives her everything he has, it's still not enough and Lisa threatens to leave immediately to avoid any potential consequences. But Arkin has a plan to get the money, asking for her to give him until midnight to come up with it, reaching out to her debtor Roy with a deal, revealing that he's been casing the Davis house for months and now knows the Ruby's location, offering a 50-50 deal to get it. And with the family out of town, this provides the perfect opportunity for him to steal it without much incident. Or so he thinks. Dun dun dun. 
Parking deep in the forest, he dons a ski mask and grabs his burgling bag, approaching the, of course, foggy house, nearly getting his face bitten off by a dog, just barely stopped by a chain and only getting the side of his mask. Phew, that was close. He breaks inside, slowly searching through the house, and appears to be empty just as he anticipated, getting to work on the hidden safe's combination with a frequency device that gives him the correct digits, then hearing the sound of a key inserting into the front door, seeing the killer's feet as he enters, and shambling upstairs towards Arkin, causing him to quickly hide, the collector arriving where he was just moments prior, standing silently and listening before moving on, giving Arkin the chance to make a break for it to the front door, but finds several new deadbolts have been installed. So getting that open is definitely not happening, but he's not about to give up on what he came here for, returning to the safe in a hurry, suddenly hearing a man's muffled screams coming from the air vents, followed by Michael plopping out of a door to the ground, his body smoking from an unseen trap, assumedly, and spotting Arkin believes he's the one behind it, crying out to know why he's doing this. As Arkin tries to get him to shut up and not draw attention to them, Michael goes for a golf club, triggering a long line tied to a tripwire that wraps around his foot, dragging him across the floor and lifting him into the air before painfully dropping him, the collector quickly appearing and snatching him away. Seeing this is enough for Arkin to decide it's best for him to get out of the house as quickly as possible, but the collector has removed this possibility, boarding up all the windows around the house, also including triggered razor blades in between the boards that tear up his hands. And when trying the phone, a spike is released that stabs into his ear and finds the entire house has been rigged with similar traps, almost not seeing a room lined with tiny, nearly invisible wires, and another room completely filled with bear traps. Carefully stepping between them, the back door is blocked as well, so he decides the safest bet is the basement, making his way through the pitch black area, hearing the collector's footsteps on the boards overhead, and an arm reaches out, startling him. It's Michael, who is looking definitely worse for wear, all beat up and strapped into a chair, filling him in on the whereabouts of the rest of his family. That his wife Victoria has also been taken somewhere else in the basement. The older daughter Jill left with her boyfriend earlier, which was pretty lucky timing. But poor little Hannah hasn't been found, and it's presumably hiding somewhere in the house. Arkin promises that he will find her, but Michael, knowing he'll need protection, gives up the safe combination where his gun is kept, along with that juicy ruby Arkin is after. But first, he checks on Victoria, finding her in a bathtub with tape covering her eyes and mouth gagged, and convinces her to scream to create a distress Action, drawing the collector's attention and letting Arkin slip past back upstairs. It initially looks like he intends to cut her tongue out, but doesn't follow through, and instead takes his rage out on Michael, cutting his ear off. As upstairs, Arkin gets the safe open, retrieving the gun and pocketing the ruby, but frustratingly finds the box of bullets to be empty. So much for defending yourself. Hearing more banging in the room, he thinks it could be Hannah, approaching the closet where the sounds are emanating from. Inside, finding the collector's red trunk, with Larry from the opening inside bloodied and looking crazed, which is fair considering he's been trapped in a box by a psycho killer for who knows how long, Larry does know a bit about the collector's intentions, that he is a literal collector of people. He kills the people he doesn't want, the rest he takes, warning Arkin if he isn't chosen, he won't be making it out of here alive. Getting louder and more frantic, Arkin has no choice but to stuff him back in the box. Hearing Michael yowling from downstairs, he knows he has some time before the killer comes a looking for him. Entering a bedroom, he finds the floor covered in a sticky, acidic substance that immediately begins to melt his shoes upon contact, like that the floor is lava game you'd play as kids, but you know, much more horrifying, especially for the poor cat that is trapped in the goo, who meows incessantly. That was brutal. Not even going to show that part. I'm definitely one of those guys that finds animal violence even more disturbing than humans. I guess I'm just a big baby. I don't know. I like fluffy things. The collector then arrives, seeing what's left of the cat, Arkin hiding himself under a mass of pillows on the bed. Maybe that's why people have so many pillows on their beds. Perfect hiding spot if you're in a sticky situation. And not finding him, the killer moves on. Returning to the basement, he finds Michael has been mutilated, his body hung upside down and disemboweled, his intestines in a pile on the floor. Well, so much for saving him. Hopefully he can still save Victoria, using a paperclip to unlock her cuffs, trying to keep her from completely losing her shit, commanding her to don't say a word and keep an eye on his back. But it understandably only takes seeing her husband's corpse to fly off the handle and not follow the rules, running up the stairs, coming right into the killer's knife who stabs her mercilessly and repeatedly before letting her tumble down the stairs. Arkin hides under a desk as the killer enters the basement, getting closer and closer to his hiding spot. But it's something else that actually has his attention, a strange looking spider that appears on the verge of death. The collector carefully gets it loose and sets it free outside, which isn't the kind of behavior we'd expect from this guy so far, and shows us he at least has a particular predilection towards bugs, more so than humans it seems, which we get a bit more on in the sequel. After giving his spider friend 
freedom, he returns to his murderous side, taking Victoria's body into another room and slamming the door, allowing Arkin to sneak past unnoticed, the collector proceeding to pour gas over Victoria's feet, setting up a camera on the other side and sewing her lips together, screaming in agony with each stitch. See, this doesn't bug me at all. Like, sure, stitch that lady's lips closed, no big deal. The cat thing, though? No, thank you. Trying to bust the boards off the windows, Arkin hears a car horn out front. It's Jill and her boyfriend making out. He does his best to warn them, but they don't hear him. Finding the front door jammed, they go around to the side. Anticipating them, the collector unlocks the door to allow them to enter his funhouse. Watching in the shadows as they start getting busy on the counter, licking his lips like he's really into it. And the mood is only spoiled when Jill sees the man watching them, both getting to their feet as the killer juggles a knife in his hands. The boyfriend goes for a punch, only to get the knife through his hand. Ooh! Stumbling back and triggering another trap that slices off his fingers. And to complete the job, the collector kicks him, falling into the bear trap filled room, crushing and tearing his body to shreds. Tossing Jill over the counter, then strangling her, she tries to secretly phone 911, getting the call through, but dropping the phone as the collector pulls her away by the hair. Arkin is able to bust the boards off a window with a pair of scissors, but this triggers an alarm alerting the collector, who has tied Jill to the banister with wire. Going off after the alarm, Arkin tries to help Jill and cuts the wire loose, but she's confused as to what he's doing here. Before he can even try to explain, she reaches for a pair of scissors, which unfortunately are attached to another trap. The line going off when she grabs him, flinging her onto a projector wall covered in nails. Woo! Since his average of helping the Davis family has been pretty much terrible so far, and he can't get Larry out of the box, the only thing left to do is save his own skin, breaking through the upstairs window and leaping off the roof. And ain't nothing gonna stop him from getting away, until seeing a surprisingly alive Hannah in the house banging on the window to get his attention, then seeing the killer shadow downstairs. And Arkin's like, ah, oh, come on, really? She's the only one I actually like, so I guess I have to go back. Ugh, this blows. But this moment is kind of his turn into becoming a full-fledged hero, putting the safety of others over his own and risking his own life in the process. The killer makes it to Hannah, screeching and slicing at the girl, saved by a braining courtesy of Arkin. Huh, well, I guess that gun still did come in handy after all. The two set up their own trap for the killer in Hannah's room. The killer kicks the door open. They push over the aquarium, dumping the water all over the floor, followed by the TV electrifying the water. But it's poor Larry who gets shocked. The collector kicks kicking him into the water and getting killed. Dang, you can't try to out-trap the collector. That's his whole thing, guys. Nice try, at least, though. He flings several throwing knives, barely missing Arkin, getting Hannah down the laundry chute, but he isn't as lucky, getting attacked and pulling off the killer's mask, seeing his face and getting knocked unconscious. Going through the house, surveying all the mayhem and murder that befell the Davis family, a storm brewing in the sky, we get a needless yet still pretty cool shot, following a lightning bolt all the way from the clouds to it thundering into the ground. Again, not sure what the point was, was, but it sure looked neat. Arkin is still alive, hooked in place by the collector, who wakes him up by slashing his forehead. Youch! Just try an alarm or something, jeez. Trying to convince him he won't find Hannah, he isn't too compelled by his blathering, taking a ball pin hammer and chisel, placing it between his teeth and knocking one out. The girl is much closer than she probably ever should be, accidentally poking out nearby and nearly drawing the collector over. And desperate to keep her safe, Arkin begins hurling insults, getting more and more extreme until the collector is forced to respond. Slicing his stomach open, and jamming in a bunch of beetles into the gaping wound. Ugh! It looks like it's all over for Arkin until the flashing of lights are seen outside. It's an officer responding to Jill's aborted 911 call, but he doesn't even make it inside. The collector popping out from behind a tree and follows orders to drop his weapon, sicking what we now know is his dog on the cop, tearing his neck out before whistling to call him off and just to make double sure he's dead, snaps the cop's neck. Arkin uses the opportunity to painfully pry himself free from the hooks, tearing up his skin and removing the restraints, and checks in on a quite dead Victoria. Spotting explosives planted nearby, realizing the killer intends to blow up the house. Seeing Arkin, he gets prepared, grabbing the shotgun from the cop's car and bringing his dog along, who almost gets Hannah's foot when they're climbing back up the laundry chute. Arkin lights the trash in a can on fire, awaiting for the dog to get closer, opening the door and shoving the flaming can into its face, then takes its still smoldering body, tossing it at the collector who blows it to smithereens. Another disturbing yet also very ridiculous moment, which leads to our final battle. Pummeling each other around the kitchen, Arkin is able to take dominance, knocking his adversary into the basement and retrieving the house keys. But they find the key has been broken, so they're gonna have to kill this guy to end this thing, setting up another simple trick, a mirror showing the reflection which the collector fires upon. As Arkin trips a chandelier trap, sending an array of dives down, impaling him. Arkin takes Hannah's hand and they run outside, the lights of a squad of police and an ambulance heading their direction.
intersection. He tries to flag them down, getting run into. Whoops, could have just stood on the side of the road, dude. As a cop swoops up Hannah, the explosives in the house trigger and a fireball consumes the house. And it appears that their torturous night at the hands of the masked man man has come to an end. And Arkin was at least able to save her. So that's something. And he also proves that he's not a total self-centered jerk. So that's good too. Character growth, hooray. Getting driven off in an ambulance, Arkin still has the ruby in his pocket. And asking the EMT what time it is, he miraculously still has time to settle his wife's debt after all. Everything's coming up Arkin. Until the not dead at all collector crashes into the ambulance, sending it flipping end over end, winding up upside down. Arkin's stuck in place in the gurney by his straps, calling out for assistance from the EMT, who gets to his feet just in time to get a knife in the eye courtesy of the killer. He cuts Arkin loose, who attempts to fight back to no avail, getting tossed into the collector's big red trunk, slamming his fingers to get the door closed, who then removes the exterminator tag on the side of the van before driving off into the rainy night. In our final post credit scene, we see the collector flipping through slides of houses, most likely surveying who to pick for his next victim. Sitting on the red trunk, Arkin still inside, yelling out his intent to kill the collector, who kicks the side of the trunk to get him to shut up. So in the end, Arkin was able to save his proxy daughter, Hannah, but not himself, with the unfortunate outcome of becoming the next addition to the collector's collection. A lot of the specifics of what the killer is doing are left pretty underdeveloped, including what he actually does with those captured, much of which is addressed in the sequel, The Collection. However, I think we still do get a good understanding of the killer's kind of twisted motivation behind his actions, mostly due to that one moment he saves the spider, amongst all the other chaos going on. Spiders are generally loathed by most people, but they are considered to be beneficial due to them eating other more annoying insects. So it almost seems that the character views himself in the same way, culling down the population and leaving only those that are worthy of his collection behind, similar to the arachnid that he shows sympathy to. This also seems tied to the odd otherworldly kind of glow that he has in his eyes, which does resemble that of a spider as well. Making this connection clear near the end when seeing a spider, the red and blue lights of the police reflecting in its eyes. Another potential reference being earlier in the night, Arkin narrowly avoids a room filled with crisscross wires, which sure looks like a spider web to me. He is the predator who has his prey, his web being his inescapable house of traps. This implies to me a kind of connected relationship to the killer and the insects that he respects, because in a way he relates to and understands them more than humans, finding them to be just pests and he, the justified spider, taking out the more useless amongst our species. At least that was my takeaway from this movie. And the sequel does delve much further into this and many more aspects to the character than presented here. So check back in the next couple days or so for my look at the collection and everything we learn about the killer there. Which brings us to the end of this ending explained on the collector. But stay tuned as there's a lot more to look at in the next movie. Overall, despite it not being regarded as favorably as the first, I admittedly actually prefer the sequel as it isn't quite as severe and and serious as the first, having a little more fun with the idea and introducing many new bizarre ideas that I was totally into. So while I do think The Collector is pretty standard torture porn fare, clearly inspired by Saw, I do think the actual Collector character is surprisingly interesting and memorable in the modern horror landscape. And before we go, don't forget you can send me requests for movies or TV shows you'd like to see me explain by sending them my way on any of my social media accounts at Foundflix or down in the comments below. What did you guys think of The Collector and its ending? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Found Flicks. See you next time.